We are going to focus tonight on uh, the exception of lignite or coal. I'm uh, Manja. All right. I'm, I'm Eva. Uh, we both uh, studied human ecology in Sweden together, and um, we learned to work with this banner, which is not made by us, but uh, which we were working with um, a few years ago. But Manja is going to tell you a little bit more about that later. And we wanted to start uh, with an interactive part. We have some uh, parts of this banner here. Maybe I'm just going to pass them around. You pick one and sit down together with two or three <coughs> people and um, talk a little bit about what you see, um, uh, what might, what kind of story might be in there, um, what you can connect with. the Appalachian Mountains, also in the eastern part of the United States. And um, they went there to talk to people and gather stories. And they gather stories about the environment, they gather stories about their past, about their future, about how they are affected. And they went back to their studio and they draw all this together. And since it was so many artists doing this together, they did it in black and white. So it unified a little bit the different styles, the different styles of the yeah, artists. Um, and I will yeah, give an explanation. Uh, this is structured, the banner is structured into five chapters pretty much. So you can imagine a timeline going through here from left to right, with this being the past and we're even standing the future. In the middle we have today, uh, starting in the middle of today, a little bit going to the right as well, definitely. <laughs> We're not there anymore. So the first chapter is this part. And it's the story about the land and our ancestors. And it tells uh, a little bit about how we take care of our land and how we related more to it, um, depended on it as well very much. And uh, the second chapter is this chapter. And it's about industrialization, industrial revolution, colonization. So it's a little bit about how everything became, it is the way it is now. So this is the middle part. It's a large chapter, all this is today. And um, it's about mountaintop removal in this case, which is a form of extraction of coal in the Appalachian Mountains. And it's exactly what it sounds, so you remove the top of the mountains, you fill valleys with it to get to the coal. Um, it's black coal in the Appalachian Mountains. We will talk a little bit more about lignite coal since we're in the Rhineland. Full of lignite coal. So. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the, today the extraction of the coal, the coal mining part. How does it stay with all this machinery? And, um, then the fourth chapter is this part. And we will talk about it a little bit more. This is the story about resistance and all different forms of resistance. And then we have the last chapter, which is, uh, you named it already, the chapter about regeneration and uh, people looking for alternatives, different solutions, creative solutions. So this would be the structured timeline wise from right to left. Um, and then there's a different structure that you can also read. It's from top to bottom, or bo bottom to up, it doesn't really matter. So the upper half is about the greater picture, so it's about national, international-wise, um, international-wide. And the lower half is more about the impact on smaller communities, on individual, it's the, the grassroots level. Yeah, so this is the foreground here, grassroots level and impacts. 
this is kind of the yeah the description the structure how to read it so now maybe you would maybe interpret your scene a little bit different but the good thing and the nice thing about this banner I think is that there is no no right or wrong about any scene so whatever you interpret with it you it's right you know you can use this Although it's been done in the Appalachian Mountains and its stories collected from the Appalachian Mountains, you can tell your own story with it. This is the idea of your banner. So we can bring this here and talk about Rhineland, for example. Yeah. So why did they choose the Appalachian Mountains? Um, because it's a special region. It is um, one of the yeah, most biodiverse, diverse, temperate forests we have. Um, it was a seed bank for all the area around where glaciers came. And it's also very special because most of the water that goes to the eastern part of the US comes from the Appalachian Mountains. All the rainwater goes there and runs down in streams to the cities, so Atlanta and Washington. Um, tap water all comes from there. And also it's very interesting because it's full of migration. Many people came from different places, people that escaped enslavement, and people migrating from Europe, um, First Nation people, everything came there together. Yeah, and the last part is full of uh, coal there. So this is where we talk about the uh, Appalachian Mountains and where it was done. And we use some examples and some stories from Appalachian Mountains and we bring some stories in from here. So I want to shortly start by talking a little bit about coal and the origin of coal. Because especially the last days, many people have been involved very much with the coal and I feel it has, um, yeah, a very negative connotation and I actually want to get rid of this a little bit because the banner is called the true cost of coal. I feel for the first chapter we could also talk about the, the true value of coal and um, what it means to us. So I shortly take you to where coal comes from. Um, it depends on where it is but in the Appalachian Mountains the coal, the black coal um, comes from an era, it's called the Carboniferous era, and it's uh, around 300 million years ago. And it was um, a time where the climate was much uh, warmer, there was a lot more carbon in the air. We wouldn't have liked it very much back then. Um, but for plants it was good, plants grew, and you see, see a lot of plants growing down here. It's, I don't know how well you can see it, you can come by afterwards. And it's plants that uh, we still see today, they are similar, familiar maybe as well. Only that they, back then they were much larger, they were as tall as a tree or even taller. And these plants, they um, sucked in all the carbon out of the atmosphere. And by that they changed the climate. And um, they didn't only suck in the carbon, but also all the toxins out of the water and the soil. So they did a great job cleaning the environment and uh, making, making space for more diversity to come. And these plants at some point they were tired and they died and they fell down and they sank into the swamps and they would gather down in the swamps and back then there was no bacteria that could decompose plants underwater without oxygen. So they would stay there and there would more plants come on top and sediments washed over and stayed and more plants. So you had a whole sandwich of plants and sediments and they got very compressed over a long time. Uh, and they got so compressed that at some point these plants became coal. This is what, where coal comes from. And I feel that uh, we have all these toxins and all this carbon in there and it cleaned everything from in these plants. So they're amazing down there. The problem is what we do with them, right? Uh, and uh, this is what Eva will talk about a little bit now. What do we do with the coal instead of keeping it in the ground? Somebody had a part, a piece, um, which we've not talked about yet. But maybe just anybody could tell me what you see here in the middle. with different houses and they're thrown away by a, um, like a digger. <laughs> yes. So I guess it's 
it's just like the villagers that get get removed because of the coal mine mm -hmm. because they're in the rain. Yeah. Um, yeah, we see here what actually happens and has happened for many years in this re very region, about 50 kilometers from here, I'm not so sure. Um, we can see a community being um, removed. And we can not only see this digger taking away the houses and the church, the, the neighborhood, we can also see what happens with nature around that. We can see that the, the, the forest is being brought away, the water is being polluted. And it's crazy to think that this is not only here in the Banner, but it happens, and it happens in the world, and it happens here in Germany, where we talk about our popular Energiewende. Um, this happens in any kind of democracy that uh, people lose their houses and their neighborhood and um, the places where they were born and that that's actually legal. That's um, not only permitted by the state but often enough even supported by state subsidies for example. Um, and it's interesting to think how that uh, came about, that, uh, that we got to this point where this is actually possible, legal and People that um, want to stand up against that are actually the ones that are making themselves illegal. In order to understand that, um, it's useful to go back a little bit in history. So we're going to go to the second chapter here. And Manja already gave a little overview about what happened here. Um, so one very important thing is um, up here where you can see a government building. And this situation here talks a little bit, a little bit about how the way our uh, government has always uh, portrayed development and um, how we develop in the Western world. You can see that the, the building is uh, made up of money and it's on top of, you can see wood here, wool, there's coal, there's also the textile industry. Up there maybe, here you can see, um, this is a cake, maybe you can see the very unequal distribution of the pieces of the cake. On top uh, you can see a reference being made to slavery, which you could argue is not so much of a topic here, you could also argue that still nowadays in all parts of the western world slavery is still a topic, but yeah, this topic is uh, being mentioned here. Um, and here's the, the, the um, railway the, for the trains, um, which also played a very important role in times of industrialization, the triangle with coal and uh, wood, um, you can see here. And here you can see how a former mining village looked like. And this is very much uh, similar to, uh, to the feudal system. You can see here, this is the house of the owner of the mine which who we could also call King Cole, because King Cole, he actually owns everything, and everything belongs to this one person. You can maybe see here the houses of the miners, they're all put into chains. And on the territory of King Cole, there's this church. So even when the miners go to church every Sunday, the priest is telling what King Cole told him to tell. Also here, the company store belongs to King Cole, so every time the, the miners want to go and buy food for the families, clothes, even the very same coal that they were digging out, they had to go and buy here in the, in the shop. And it's a very common story that no matter how hard the miners worked and how much coal they dug out, at the end of the month they would add up their payment and what they spent. and it was never actually enough and that was a different but also kind of slavery because they would get indebted and indebted more and more to King Cole. Here this is also a very interesting aspect because you can see that the train is actually taking the coal away. So especially during these times it was um, not a surprise for people to 
suffer under the circumstances of their environment being exploited and their natural resources being dug out, but actually themselves for many, many years, 60, 70 years, even staying without electricity themselves, because usually this is being brought to other places. So how would you feel if you lived in this kind of situation on the territory of King Cole? Very little possibilities. Exploited. Exploited. Hmm. Suffering under the system. Mm -hmm. Suffering the system. Helpless. Helpless. And a lot of people felt very angry. And um, they got together. And here you can see what is basically the first days of the labor unions of the miners. Um, and this is also very interesting to think that a lot of the rights that we still have today were being fought for by um, the, the miners in the labor unions. Things like a free weekend or the prohibition of child labor, health care, the eight hours a day, those are things that were achieved by, by these labor unions who fought a lot. And um, who fought, you can see here, there's being reference made to, to the mine wars, and they achieved a lot. So here you can see them celebrating. Um, and we don't want to make the mistake of thinking that just because these labor unions back in these days were all made out of men, because men were the ones going to mine, that women were not playing an important role. But here, I hope that you can see it, that the chair is not so much in front of it. Here we can see the females also very much being part of the struggle. On the one hand, doing the care work. On the other hand, um, doing things like connecting to the neighbors, building up this kind of local, um, local communities, grassroots, mo grassroots movements, um, which are much more difficult to divide because they have made their connections with their neighbors. They even uh, developed their own forms of communication. There's a very popular story about women who were making quilts and putting them up into the windows in order to communicate when, for example, the next secret meeting was going to take place. And here, this fox is writing, which side are you on, and is making um, reference to Aunt Molly Jackson, a very famous singer-songwriter who wrote a lot of songs about um, the mind struggles and um, accompanied the movement with her songs. So when we move a little bit in time, here we can see what we ca call the continuous miner. Here they, they are still mining, and as we talked about earlier, here you can see helmets are going into this huge coal coal plant. And here we are talking about mechanization. Because now, little by little, machines are getting bigger and more powerful and stronger, and they can do a lot of what used to require a lot of workers. And this machine is eating up these helmets because now there are not so many workers needed anymore. So imagine you're one person that got a job which 200 people would love to do but they just lost their jobs due to mechanization. Would you still fight for your right and stand up if you don't get the health insurance that you actually should get? Maybe not difficult. So due to mechanization, a lot of people actually lost a lot of the rights that the labor union had um, gained. And um, here we can see this huge power plant now, which is eating away lush landscape, forests, rivers, countryside. And it all goes here into this huge machine. And here you can see that it's carrying behind it this long train of products. Up here, this is very interesting as well. We talked about the bald eagle and how the, uh, the smokestacks here look like uh, missiles. This makes reference to war because um, the Ministry of Defense of the United States is actually the biggest industrial consumer of fossil fuels and at the same time emits more than 
anybody else more than entire countries together. And it's crazy to think that this department is actually destroying a lot of the infrastructure which is still working. Um, just three hours ago I was um, at a talk of the People's Climate Summit about climate change, military and war. And there were people, I think the plenum was basically from all over the world. There was somebody from Borneo, from the Philippines, from Kenya, from Colombia, and they were all telling their stories of how um, militarization and war and climate change are very much connected for them and their communities. Um, so this maybe can remind us that it might make sense to connect the the peace movement and the environmental movement, because at the end of the day, it's very similar things that um, we are fighting for. So to come back to this uh, long train of products that we can see here, this all goes into this temple of consumption. Maybe you can see this temple of consumption has this little green band-aid on. What is that? Is that a rooster or something in the logo of the consumption? Here? That is our part. Uh -huh. I don't think it's a rooster or other kind of animal. Um, no, it's a leaf. Uh -huh. It has this band-aid with a green yeah. leaf on, so it's the temple of consumption is trying to, you know, like get this green band-aid and um, portray itself as a... You could com uh, compare it maybe with an ecological supermarket or something like that, you know? It's, uh, it's trying to have this green image, but at the end of the day, it's a temple of consumption. So what about this morphine? Um, uh, welcome. You can see uh, something which we could maybe call uh, some kind of the American dream. There is everybody with their own big SUVs. They all have their own car here, uh, their own house here. They play golf. Um, but if we draw the connection from here, where we can see landscape being exploited, destroyed, all being sucked up, being fed into this huge coal power plant to produce, and actually to produce things that, and that's a very common story as well, um, even though we know how to produce things which could last forever, or at least years or months, um, maybe some of you have heard of the term of plant obsolescence. We often enough produce things that last just a few weeks or days, or maybe just as long as it takes us to eat up our lunch and throw away plastic spoon and plastic fork. So this is what we can see here, the big poop shoot. There are all of these products that were being produced by the means of exploiting all this landscape actually being thrown away again because we still don't even know where to go with all this waste that we're producing. And this is, um, this is just crazy if you think about here, you can see coal keeps the light on, it says. And this is due to our lifestyle. And this talks about the linear system, which we can see today, where, where we're actually just getting out healthy, lush landscape to produce products, which then we're throwing away. Here, I think somebody probably had this situation as well. Here we can now see something that we, um, that we call the Dance of Hard Choices, which talks about the modern day situation of miners. Here we can see this miner trying to detonate something. This frog has his or her, her helmet on because work is still more or less dangerous there. And you can see here this paycheck being rolled in at the end of this fishing line with this promise full of products because that's at the end of the day where it is. It's a paycheck that is promising us everything that we can consume once we earn all that money with, by doing our job. But here in the next step, you can see that the minor frog has already some backache. The little frog is looking a little bit desperate at the water because the water apparently is not drinkable anymore, it's polluted. 
The gardener frog here is looking at its harvest, also not eatable anymore. And this is crazy because here, for example, you can see that the water is black, probably not drinkable anymore. But actually, in reality, often enough, people don't realize how the quality of their water is. And they drink their tap water for years and years, and sometimes even slowly intoxicating themselves without noticing. So here you can, for example, see the scar of this frog, which makes reference to, uh, to a village in Western Virginia where they had to take out the gold bladder of 90% of the population because it had filled up with heavy metals and toxins over the year. And their teeth were falling out, they had rare, uh, rare sorts of cancer. Because mining had polluted their groundwater and nobody was aware of that, nobody told them, and they just kept drinking and intoxicating themselves. So here, the next step, the two go to this, um, literally this uh, pharmaceutical donkey. You can see he has this vest, this jacket on with all the logos of uh, pharmaceutical um, enterprises. He's selling bottled water, and the frog is paying with his or her own money, because that's what we do. Um, and here, he or she is left with the last coin, just looking a little bit desperate, and puts his or her helmet on again to go back to work. And the little frog is standing here now, wondering what to do, because the little frog could either now join the circle and um, just do the same thing his or her family has been doing for so many years, which at the end of the day means destroying your own land, or going somewhere else, going to this bus stop and trying to leave and do something else, which maybe means not starting to work in the mine business, but at the end of the day, leaving your land and also leaving behind everything without protection. Um, yesterday I was talking to a miner and um, he told me a little bit about his family and how he's been working for 35 years in this mine and um, it gave me a little insight on how, how much connected this whole environment of him growing up with getting music lessons which are sponsored by the energy company and his father already working in the mine and um, yeah, just this culture that people grow in of mining. On top of this here, you can see this great hurricane, which reminds us of the fact that we are all part of this, that it's not just the people in the global south that are suffering, or us in Europe or wherever, um, getting out natural resources, but at the end of the day, we're all part of this because it's all interconnected, and uh, you cannot divide one thing from the other. Um, so this is kind of looming on top of everything. But there's also good news. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to be able to tell some of the good news. And especially now, since we're here in uh, Bonn and all these days, there's so much um, resistance happening. Because as I told you before, this chapter is about resistance and all different kinds of resistance. So the last days we have different forms already of resistance. We saw demonstrations, spike demonstrations. We have uh, conferences where people come there and discuss these strategies and ideas. We had ending and the civil disobedience. Yeah, we have the financial support from people joining the connection. So and we see all this here as well. Um, so for example here, uh, I think you call it a library. I don't know who had this. You have a community organizing meeting, people coming together, animals in this case coming together, these animals are all endangered species in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, they come together and they are the, yeah, they're from land, from air, from water, and they discuss strategies and uh, think about what can we do to regain power in our region, in our community. How can we work together? And uh, we haven't talked really about why we see animals only and not humans, we can do that later. But so we see here different animals with different traits, like we have this bat with large ears uh, that tells us to remember to always listen well to everyone, 
to think about what they say. We have the snail that shows us that even small steps are steps if we know which direction we go to. Um, we have bird, birds bringing in culture, um, bringing in knowledge, maybe also through music. So what they do is they gather around maps um, where they write down their watersheds and their pressure points of the coal m of the mining. So they think about strategies, how can we do it differently? And uh, as you said, there's an empty chair and it's, uh, I think it looks very inviting. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, I think we never know who might then be the next ally who might come and join in this whole resistance. Um, so everyone is invited to join here. Um, we have different uh, protesters here. Mm, they're preparing a demonstration, manifestation. They have all these different signs saying, for example, no jobs on a dead planet. Um, so they're getting ready to make maybe a demonstration walk together. Uh, here we see different animals signing a petition with all the different paws and claws and what they have. Mm. And uh, these are very like the local, the local people that are actually affected um, and impacted by the coal mining. We have also activists that come from the outside. They come parachuting in here. We have the hare, <coughs> we have a turtle. And I don't know how well you can see it, but this rabbit, for example, um, brings in all these tools from the outside, brings in technology, is talking on the phone, maybe sending, I don't know, tweets, whatever, connected to all these people, it's doing networking. And it has some, um, it's all like a um, graduation hat on top. So maybe it comes directly from a uh, university. I think many activists uh, come from university <laughs> in many cases. <laughs> Brings in uh, education, definitely. And also has some nice tools here, some climbing gear, some bicycle lock-on. We don't know, maybe some direct action happening here. Um, we also have the <laughs> turtle coming in as well, parachuting, bringing in a lot of technology, a laptop and uh, the camera. So this turtle might think to go there in order to do a documentary on the region. Um, but what we see here is this connection uh, of this rabbit showing these two where to land and what to do. Because it tells us that we can't just go anywhere and do whatever we think is best for the region. It's um, about listening again. And this butterfly, for example, here represents um, the needs of the community, telling the rabbit what is it what we need, the complex situation the community is in. And so the rabbit knows how to indicate these two what to do. And we see that this turtle actually was more needed, instead of doing a documentary, it was more needed to do water, uh, how do you call it? Um, yeah, probe yeah, water. Yeah, yeah <coughs> down here. Uh, this is true actually in the Appalachian Mountains, it's very important and uh, a lot of people were coming in and doing this, testing the water and checking that. So it's a little bit about being aware of what is needed and maybe also adjust to that. Um, we have other sorts of um, resistance, for example here we have a small uh, animal climbing through a fence, I don't know if you can see it. And uh, here it says no hunting, no fishing. So in the back, it's um, company property. So you're not allowed to pass, you're not allowed to go there. And um, one way of resistance is yeah, your existence, that you just go and continue hunting, fishing, for example, on the company's property, which is happening in the Appalachian Mountains. Um, <coughs> I feel also we have, for example, the Hamacher Forest close to here. and. Um, people are existing in an area where they're not supposed to be and by that they're resisting. We have a, a military here that is looking at all the small written things on the permits and uh, it's making, I don't know if you can see, it's making paper airplanes out of all the things. So it's trying to throw back something with its legal knowledge <coughs> and it's trying to stop <coughs> this new coal-fired power plant here. It's trying to stop it or to slow it down. So you see all these airplanes going there. 
and is at least stopping the gears here. A hearing request has landed and slows down the machine by stopping yeah, the gears. So maybe this might not be enough. It's a good thing, maybe it stops at least, it slows down the machine. It might not be able to stop the whole power plant from running. But what it can do is it can at least give time for other amazing people. People that, um, like this rabbit, for example, but people that decide to do some direct action, some civil disobedience, that lock themselves on the street, that blockade the street. Yeah, I don't know if you can see this, so there are three animals locking themselves to the street here. Um, and what I think is so amazing to see all this together, I just uh, was very involved in the actions of uh, Endegelende, and only in this one action, all these different aspects were actually represented. So we had a legal team that was giving up advice all the time, and we had the community in Bühr, the region um, where all this um, Endegelende was happening, and they gave us the church to have our office in because we didn't have any other place. And we had the garden of the community to store all the material and for the vigil points, for example. Um, we had legal demonstration, a legal finger yesterday going. We had civil disobedience. So all of this coming together and we have had people from the Pacific Islands coming, the Pacific Island Warriors coming, making a ceremony. So it was all of this bringing together in one action, and I think it's so beautiful and so strong, yeah, when it comes to <coughs> So there are other forms of resistance, which I would not consider as real resistance, but they pretend to be some kind of resistance, some green resistance. And Eva will talk a little bit about that as well. <laughs> um, I'm writing my master thesis about the environmental movement and um, it's as big as it sounds and um, it's funny to think how much we could actually label the environmental movement and Manja was just talking here about environmental movement, about environmentalism, resistance but this part up here actually also considers themselves the environmental movement. But this is the part that uh, maybe we would like to question a little bit more. So here, for example, you can see um, these inflatable tubes that say go green and that are giving permissions. But they're actually bending as much as they can so they can give permission on whatever kind of thing that's passing their way and they're um, accepting money there from this bank and it all looks a little bit like hot air and weird and yeah it says they donate now feel better um, I think that's understandable <laughs> um, here we can see um, this government building and there's hands shaking hands behind the curtain we also don't really know what's happening there there's this revolving door here and there's these people passing from the banks to the government building and back and forth and back and forth. And we're wondering why are they passing back and forth between the government building and the banks, what's happening there, but we also don't really understand. Um, it's just shadows and um, weird. So maybe here we can see uh, some part of the mercantilization of the green movement. We can see their trade with the atmosphere. There's these scissors cutting apart our atmosphere, putting on dollar signs to also commercialize those. Why not? Um, and here we can see um, something that we ca uh, call the exposition of false solutions. Somebody, I think, also had that. It was the smallest part of all the pieces. But maybe we can all just try together to see. I'm sure that back there um, that's not going to happen, but maybe you can try. <laughs> yeah? What, um, what we can see here, what is being uh, exposed there? Mm -hmm. Nuclear power plant. There's a nuclear power plant, yes. So no uh, greenhouse emissions. With no greenhouse emissions, what else can we see? Platform symbolizes every kind of energy. Sorry? Mm. So the platform uh -huh. 
or it symbolizes every kind of energy, solar energy, LNG, <coughs> gas energy, and energy gas. power, wind energy, and wind turbines, and biofuels. And so, below, and below that, the temple is symbolizing the worship of money. Uh huh. Yeah. There you can see like two people worshiping money. Always a good idea. Um, so this is a little bit about what also Manya talked about earlier, because Manya said that coal is actually amazing, and. Um, this maybe connects a little bit to this, because when we talk about the true cost of coal and we're spending one and a half to two hours just talking about all these stories and everything that's happening, it's easy to say, all right, I got it, coal is bad, so what else can we do? And maybe that's a weird question to ask, because this all talks about how people are desperately trying to find other solutions, other forms of energy, Staying in this mindset of we just need to find the right source of energy and then we're going to be good. Um, but it does not question at all everything that we've been talking about here from the second to the third to the fourth chapter of just producing and producing and producing to consume and consume without actually thinking about the consuming to then throw it away again. It does not uh, question at all the linear system. So this is uh, the exposition of false solutions. Because um, there's not this one solution of the energy source. This is not about coal, this is about the system. Um, oh, I'm laughing because today in the other panel, they were also saying about system change and climate change, which is a nice slogan, but actually has a lot behind it. And uh, I think this also connects to this, that um, we actually need a, a change of lifestyles, of consumption, of a lot more than just, hey, let's use a few more wind turbines and let's try to leave some more coal in the, in the hole. <laughs> um, yeah, so we're wondering, where could we go to? What could we do? What could we do differently? Maybe Mania wants to tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> nice things. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. So the question is, where do we get solutions from and other, other creative solutions? And um, the idea is a little bit this. So this is already the future uh, and the chapter of regeneration. And many people say what we have to do is we have to look back a little bit into the first chapter. Uh, how did people live there? And what was their mindset? So it's not about doing everything the same way they did back then. Um, but it's a little bit about understanding this mindset of uh, living in cycles and living with the land and in stewardship of the land. So what we see here is different animals taking care of the land. We have the squirrels that are hiding the nuts uh, in the leaves and they plant them there, in order, they put them there in order to find them actually in the next spring. What's happening is that those squirrels, um, and they don't have a good memory, right? So they don't find most of these nuts again. Um, which is amazing, because what they're doing with it is they're planting the trees for the next generation of squirrels. Um, so it's taking care of the land. We have the beaver here, here up here. They're um, <coughs> putting down the trees and they're building dams. And it might seem destructive, maybe. What they're doing is with these dams that they're slowing down the flow of the stream and they create a small pond behind where fish can grow big and where the herring can get some food. They, um, yeah, they forbid erosion to happen and all the sand that would go down here lands behind the dam. So when these beavers move on to one, two, three years later to the next place, the dam some, yeah, slowly and does itself, and what is left is all this uh, fertile soil, and everything gets greener and richer um, around here. Or, for example, up here we have some snails, and they're harvesting three different kinds of vegetables here. It's uh, a reference to the three sisters uh, coming from, uh, yeah, in uh, the Americas you talk about, in from Arcadia. It's uh, squash, corn, and beans. And these three vegetables, they 
Yeah, they support each other, they grow better with each other, they make the soil richer. So it's every year they make it richer. So it's about taking care of the land and finding solutions that um, does not harm your neighbor, the environment. Um, yeah. So we see also here other ways of culture, people coming together, telling stories, making uh, handcrafts and um, yeah, different kinds of things. We take a picture of how to live. It's uh, with sickness and that, and everything happening back then as well. It's just to get a little bit more of this mindset of living again with the land and how we can take care of it. Yeah. And so this is what is trying, what people are already trying to do. So what we see here are all solutions that people have come up with already. So there's no utopian future shown here. I think it's the idea is to, yeah, to inspire people and to continue with what they're doing. Um, and we see all these um, rests of what, what was left from all this time before. So we have here the shovel of the digger with all these car tires. Down here you will not be able to see it. There's a lot of rubbish here. So with all this, what do we do? How, we do, how do we work with this? How do we make it better again, take care of it? Um, and there are different scenes. One scene, uh, one group of you <coughs> had uh, these uh, animals down here, the seven salamanders. I don't know who had that. It's um, it's a scene where there are seven generations of uh, women salamanders shown, and it's with this idea to always think about the three generations that came before us and uh, to acknowledge what they did, and the three generations that are to come. So every choice we take, everything we do, always have that in mind. There will be others that uh, yeah, will have to live with the consequences. So this salamander, for example, here is um, weaving a tapestry that follows through all the salamanders to do exactly this, connect them all. We have one young mother here who's bathing her baby in the water, which shows a little bit yeah, how else you could use water? You don't have to wash coal with it and then have toxic waste and toxic water coming out that is polluting everything and people can't drink it and plants can't grow. You can just use it to wash your baby. Do you like nice life, yeah, life things. And then we have here an expecting mother that is learning from her great-grandmother, from the great-grandmother about medicinal plants and um, local knowledge that can be um, given on. Here we have a salamander that is learning from the grandmother how to plant plants that are cleaning the water <coughs> and the soil. So it's all this knowledge about this local knowledge here. I think one group also had this part. It's, um, it's a community kitchen. So it's all different animals bringing their tools and the knowledge together and the food that they harvested um, in their gardens and on the fields. And they can it, they make it ready for the winter, they seem like they want to sell it on a market, maybe to create a food-based local economy. Um, and they share all the tools they have. Um, and then there's, of course, yeah, we have, of course, the worms and the maggots here that are preparing the soil and working the soil, making it rich. We have flies that are collecting rainwater and that are saving seeds all things that uh, have been done before as well that are still very important to do. And then there's one aspect we haven't really talked about in the second chapter. The so in the Appalachian Mountains, uh, a lot of the indigenous people were chased out of the region. And uh, this here is called the Trail of Tears. It's all animals that are chased out that are hurt. Um, and they had to leave their land. So what we see here is animals coming back and they have all their flags and some yeah, native uh, symbols on it. And so they, they come back to their land, they feel they're responsible again for their land, they're allowed to go back. And I feel this is happening already. I felt last year there was so much talk about the Dakota Access Pipeline and it was so strong to hear about people like yeah, Native Americans that had such a strong noise voice, and I feel it's um, yeah, we can get there definitely. Um, and then of course there's the aspect of energy. 
Um, did we need it? Did we not need it? So here you have these. Uh, you talked about it. You you had this picture up here. These birds that are taking down the power lines. And this is not to say that we don't need energy at all. We don't want it at all. But these power lines they represent energy that comes from somewhere else and that leaves a dirty coal mine behind, for example, toxic wastewater, people that are affected by it. So we have this, it's called like a sacrifice area, where the energy comes from, where it's produced. And these lines, they bring it to somewhere else, where people get all the benefits from it. So what they're doing is they take this down, and they take responsible for their own energy and their energy production. They put up small wind turbines. These animals over here, they they think what's yeah they see what's best for our community, what works best here, what do we need? Then here we have a crawfish. This is uh, based on a story also from the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, it was told to the artists of the beehive. There was one guy who made this little hydro power <coughs> out of um, car units and air conditioning units and found it all on the scrapyard and built this small um, hydropower and uh, it's giving electricity for its um, his caravan in the mountains. So you find all, yeah, all these creative different solutions. Um, up here in the tree you have some bees that uh, bring boxes of food, um, it says CSA. It's a community support agriculture. They bring it to different areas. And um, up there you have the, these wasps. Um, they're called paper wasps. And what they do is that they have a um, printer cooperative. And these wasps stand for using what we have and making something better of it, out of it. So I don't know who had this, but what they're doing is they're not only producing and printing things, but they're also growing yeah, fruits and vegetables on the balcony. They're isolate, insulating their, uh, their hive. They have some solar panels up there. So they want to tell us, we have so much already. Let's, let's make it even a little nicer. Let's use it. Yeah. And um, maybe to end this chapter, up here we have two birds that are hugging. It says, welcome home. Um, so this is a, a scene that is welcoming the people again at all that had to leave their land and, they can't, and um, their home. And they're yeah, back, back where they're supposed to be and where they can work um, not destroying the land they love. Yeah. So this is about the, the fifth chapter. And there's a really nice thing that you can do with this banner. It's for all the people who don't want to see the middle part all the time. For people maybe who are affected by it, um, who live in a region like this, they want to hang up this and talk about it, but they don't want to see all this middle part all the time. Or people who are very engaged in resistance and they don't want to show how engaged they are in resistance, so they don't show this. So what you can do is, you can fold this together. We can't do this here right now. But you can imagine this, I'm sure. So you have these two trees here, right? And what you do is you bring them together in the middle. And then you see these beautiful cycles coming together. So you have the water <coughs> running from there all the way through here, going up here. You have uh, the Native Americans there being chased out here. And they come back over there. Um, you have here the snails harvesting, and over there you have all the worms and maggots preparing the soil. You have musicians over here. Where do we have them? Here. These are. Um, this is actually three instruments that are the grandparents of mountain instruments and mountain music right now. They come from different areas. So you have ancient music types here, and you have all these modern musicians over here bringing all this together. And um, what you also have is when you look up there, you have this uh, beautiful night sky and stars and everything. And you go over there, 
and you see the rising dawn. So it all comes together, um, showing us how we live in cycles, how everything works in cycles. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, wow. It would be, um, uh, is there any questions? Yes, we can do some other questions. Yeah. <coughs> when was the Bennett produced and how do you, like you know the stories now, like how does the collective um, care that it's taken to different places and that the stories are told, mm -hmm. how does it work? So the collective um, does a lot of work themselves in the USA. Um, I'm also in contact with some people in Colombia who also work with it. Um, they have very different ways of working, um, each of them. For example, the people in Colombia, because of political reasons, they don't do any workshops apart from when they actually request it. So Manya and me now wrote to people time and time and said, hey, we would like to give a workshop. They wouldn't do that. Um, they give workshops um, and we, for example, learned how to work with it in a multiplication seminar, um, which a friend of mine gave and I'm going to give one in February if you would like to get more engaged um, with the banner. I'm happy to give you my email address. Um, and I think that every person who works with it has his or her own style of doing it. For the last year, for example, I've been in South America and I've mainly just do, uh, been doing interviews with it, so rather letting other people tell what they see within there. But yeah, there's different forms of how you want to work with it. And it's produced, um, I think they started 2005, I think, 2004. It took them about seven years. Um, yeah, and as Manya said, a lot of people. Uh, the Beehives Collective still exists. Right now they're working on a banner about Detroit, about cities, um, city development, but they've already been working for a lot of years. And <coughs> you can also go there and have them do an internship there. Um, yeah. They have another banner about Plant Colombia, about Mesoamerica Resist, about the uh, resistance movements in Central America. A lot to explore. And all under Creative Commons, you're invited to just use the graphics whenever you want to or just work with it. This, for example, I just downloaded online, send it to a company who does XXL printing <laughs> and print it out. Talking about prints, we have some uh, printouts here, <coughs> which are slightly smaller. And um, <laughs> yeah, we're happy to, we're, you're invited to take one with you if you want to. Um, it would be amazing if you could leave a donation in between five to 10 euros for printing costs. And we always send this around in Germany to people who want to work with it. Yeah. It's amazing for children. Um, especially because it has these animals, as Manya said, we're used to also connecting a lot of characteristics to certain animals and kids very much connect to, to the images. <coughs> yeah, then maybe we can ask you about the animals at least for two minutes. Um, because we said one reason why animals, but I think it's always there are so many nice ideas that come together. Why, why are animals used here and not humans? What, what can you gather? What animals, <coughs> what ideas? Apart from the traits that we see in animals, yes. Yeah, they're not really prejudiced. Like, if you only take like white human, you know, and there's no difference between those animals. Everyone has their own relation to them. Mm -hmm. Not like they um, groups in a way like we put that in. If you would take humans for everything, if you should maybe pay attention to take from different countries, regions of the world, it's easier, I think, 
Yeah, exactly. It's that like they they chose they don't have to choose a gender or a race or an age. Or, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, it's very easy to fall back on stereotypes when you try to portray a human being. Mm -hmm. I think they were. for me it makes it easier to get into a moment where I can listen and imagine histories and stories. Mm -hmm. like it's, it pulls me out of out of the real context. So. I think maybe it connects to the childness. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Something is there. Yeah. But maybe, and in addition to what you said, it's, it's also a bit the other way around because there are animals that are much more discriminated against than others, that, mm -hmm. and, like rats and pigeons and mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. They tend not to be liked so much. Like For example, taking this part, worms and maggots, like yeah. animals that are definitely no heroes usually, but uh, the amazing work they're doing here. Yeah. <laughs> I've been wondering about that for the last almost two years. <laughs> um, I think that's the interesting thing about storytelling. When is the moment that you actually start to tell the story? Um, it depends, I think, a little bit on whether you think that the problem that we have today is information and whether you use this as a tool for raising awareness or whether you rather want to get to emotions of people. Because for me, my experience is that I'm telling things that especially during the last year in South America, people are hearing, and at the end of the day, I'm not telling them any new stories. They know what is happening. They know all of this. They are often enough affected themselves by the things. Um, so personally, I would always like to try and tell more stories and um, try to get to emotions of people and um, draw a bigger picture and at the same time getting more into detail uh, rather than um, just giving specific <coughs> facts. And I think you also mentioned that in the beginning, hey, it's not just about, so here you can see this and that, this is happening because this and this was here, but trying to tell a story. Um, I don't find it so easy. Um, I can feel myself, I think because we've just grown up always intellectualizing everything, um, I always fall back on just describing. Um, but I think that this is amazing to try out how storytelling can work for transformation and how we can try to um, use what we already know but still make a difference because um, We've learned about the information deficit hypothesis, <laughs> about the fact that information do not uh, change people's behavior often, unfortunately. You can see that with smoking or with any other thing. <laughs> there was no uh, <laughs> offense at all. <laughs> um, uh, well, if we're strict on time, we're too late. It would be amazing if you could give us those back because um, it would be nice to do this again.